Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam Frat Podcast, Tyler and Sam, and we're talking all about central lines. So Sam put in some real work doing an entire workbook by himself on central lines, and I thought he did a great job. It's got really good illustrations, analogies, um, and then you met with Austin Brook. I always want to say Brooks. Austin Brook. And you guys talked all about it. And he's got a really good knowledge of it. He's even got a business, I believe, that goes around and puts in pick lines in people. And uh, I'm, I'm just curious, what made you all of a sudden be like, hey, I'm going to do a workbook on Central Line Access? Yeah, it, it comes from teaching different classes where we talk about different scenarios where, you know, what would you do in this scenario or that scenario? And sometimes scenarios come up where, you have a dialysis patient or you have a patient that's, you know, receiving some type of maybe like chemotherapy or antibiotics at home and they have a port or there's just a lot of those things. Um, or even an inner facility transport and, you know, your peripheral access blows. And it's like, what are you going to do in those situations? And I talked to a lot of clinicians who are like, yeah, we are not allowed to touch any pick line, any type of central access at all, like under no circumstances. There's even some people who's protocols and guidelines say that they can't even touch that in a cardiac arrest and so they're they either have to try so many times peripherally or go straight to io or whatever they do and i think that there's definitely times when we go you know go through it in the workbook and everything where yeah there, there's there's times when like you shouldn't touch a central line or a pick line for various reasons that you know go into it here austin and i talk about it and it's in the workbook and stuff but there's definitely times when it is the most appropriate thing to do for the patient and there's just there's just more that goes into it than it's just an iv that extends a little bit further there's actually some some things that you can learn from like accessing those lines that even you should be carrying over to like peripheral access and so it's really it's supposed to be a springboard for people to reevaluate what their guidelines are and be like you know should we be accessing these things more are we accessing them too much like did is there some things that we just didn't know that we should be doing that we're just kind of free ball on this right now <laughs> it's you know we're not doing it the way we should so i thought it'd be a good resource but there's always there, there's reading about it and then there's training on it too and i think that anytime somebody implements this like this isn't a guideline for you to just go and be like oh we're, i'm just gonna go out on my own and access these now but it's a springboard to say like how do these things generally work what's the anatomy of them uh and, and what would i actually have to do to get competent on these things and I, there's a workbook isn't enough but like you should always go out simulate it on some equipment that's not attached to a patient go and do some icu time or something talk to an icu nurse that accesses these things or puts them in night and day and, and they can definitely show you how to do it safely yeah i like that you guys got into the logistics the workbook gets into the logistics often talking about like you know the the access of or the uh, the process of flushing it and clamping it and adding keeping a little pressure in there uh the discussion on heparin i thought was was great and honestly if somebody wanted to put this into their guidelines they could literally use part of the workbook the pictures and all of that and and include that into their guidelines obviously you have to get that signed off and stuff but this is a tool so you guys can go to the website download it it's free it's a pdf and then um while you're going through it, listen to the podcast that Sam did with Austin that we're getting ready to play. And then if you guys have any questions, hit us up, just team at foamfrat.com. But yeah, nice job with the workbook, man. Yeah, thanks. And a special thanks to, yeah, Austin for sure. Brittany Granfield answered a ton of my questions that I had and she helped me proofread it as well. Kristen helped me proofread it and fix some things and you did as well. So uh, it was a team effort for sure. Uh, and it's not one of those like crazy long workbooks. It's, it's about as long as one of my average blogs. It's, you know, <laughs> so I figured, you know, it, probably better to just put it in PDF form. But yeah, hopefully you guys in, enjoy it and yeah, reach out with any questions and uh, yeah, let's hit the interview. All right. Sounds good. Let's roll it. So Austin, thanks for, for joining me. Um, so we'll start with the first question. When would you not use a line and go like peripheral line or IO instead? So you come across this patient, could be in a facility, maybe nobody's accessed the port yet, or maybe it's like pre-hospital and you just happen to find somebody with a port. What, what would be a red flag to you and say like, no, we're, we're not going to access this thing. We're going to go, let's start an IV or if the patient's really needing one, let's go IO. Yeah. So I think I kind of, in my mind, I break them up into three kind of sections is 
is this a resuscitative phase? Is this the emergent phase? Or is this kind of just the long-term care, um, like hospitalization, possibly discharge? So most of the people we're going to see are in that resuscitative versus emergent, kind of making that decision. Um, with those people that like critically need access, I really wouldn't spend a lot of time with their devices. I'd probably start 18 gauge or greater if you can, um, and then go from there. If it's in the hospital and the doctor's able, like they're getting a lot of blood products or uh, they're going to need some really heavy resuscitation, then something like a cortis is really, really great, which is just the introducer sheath to a central line. So you can basically stop at the sheath. It gives you like this massive eight French line and you can just slam fluids, blood, uh, drugs in there all day long. Um, but in those people where you're kind of like, well, they have a device, should I access it or not? Um, it really depends on what the device is. So I think most of the lines we'll see in the pre-hospital setting specifically or in a care facility, that's going to be like your pick lines, maybe a midline, uh, which is really just a pick line cut off at the axilla. It's just measured to be short. Um, so it gives you kind of the benefits of a central line with having durable access without having the infection risk of a central line. So those have gotten really popular. And then the last one you'll see a lot is the the port, right? The implanted port. And I don't know a lot of services that are carrying Huber needles. Um, so I would almost never touch that. In like those critical phases where you can't get anything else and they happen to have a port. I know we have a policy locally where we can make base contact, talk to an MICN, um, and then make the decision if we're just going to jam a regular uh, like uh, hypodermic needle in there. But it's going to ruin the port. So that's why you really want to make that um, pretty, it's a pretty heavy decision to make. Really, a lot of the time, like people are going to be great just starting peripheral lines. Um, these central lines exist for long-term care or heavy vesicate medications that are be going over a long period of time. So that whole trend of like, oh, they're getting pressors. Now we have to put in the central line. That's kind of fallen away um, because we've realized, man, like four or six hours of norepinephrine at a pretty reasonable concentration isn't going to cause uh, extravasation. It's not going to cause venous failure. So. That's typically where you just, you know, throw in an 18, you get your, I think it's as much as like two liters in 10 minutes. Like you can get plenty through an 18 gauge, much more than we'd ever really feasibly need to manage. Um, and then just don't really touch the line until you know if it's confirmed or not. Cause all these, like the, these lines, once they're the only time, you know, they're in the right place is right after the x-ray is taken mm -hmm. from there. Like they get pulled out all the time. Like, I think probably the most common thing that people come into the ER for with a pick line is they pulled out their pick line. It's rarely complications. It's rarely that they're getting sicker. It's just they snagged it on something because it's this big, like, just uncomfortable thing. They snagged it getting out of the shower. They pulled it halfway out. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the ones. Nursing home, changing yeah, shirt. Yeah. Right. It happens all the time. And always, it's not always under, like, you know, carelessness. It's just really easy to pull these things out because they're not sutured in place. They're just on this little uh, sticky device. So uh, not uncommon at all. So those are the ones you really just don't want to touch um, if you really don't have to. Yeah. If you were running a code or if somebody was on the verge of coding, would you weigh, like, how does, does that change your decision-making model at all where they, you know, they have like, let's say it's a couple lumens on a pick or something like that, or, you know, they have something where they are sitting in like, yeah, a nursing home or something like that, or you find them out in the field. Does that change your decision-making process at all where it's like, I have this access, do I want to mess with it? If it's, you know, a couple ports, maybe one is accessible or not, or they're already coded. Does that change how you weigh those options? I think if they've already coded, it does, right? It's not because it's in a vein, at least. It may not be in the optimal location, which would be the cavoatrial junction right in that SVC, sitting right before the fluid or right right at the tip of the, the junction where it goes into the atria. Mm -hmm. So that's our ideal location. It may not be sitting right there. It may have even flipped up into the IJ, but it's still in a vein. So like at least medications are going the right place, just any other place that we would put them if we were to start it. So yeah, I think if it's if it's like critical access and we're starting a code and they have a pick line, probably not, not going to be harmful uh, to use it and really not worth the time to start another line. Everyone on the scene is going to look at you like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you, you know, why are you starting another you line? After right. everybody's right. pressuring you to access the line, then you're, right. you're sitting there missing and there's, there's a certain amount of pressure, I suppose. Yeah, 100. Which, you know, it's probably the right decision to get extra access, get an IO or get a peripheral um, so that you know it's good. But yeah, I mean, to get that first dose of Epi on board while you're doing all your other stuff, I think it's perfectly appropriate to, to use a pick or a or a device like that. Probably so, not so, a port, but with all the yeah. others, yeah. So is it, how do you pick a port? So let's say that you do, because some people are just going to have a single lumen. I used to wonder why that was, but it's like more lumens, more infection, right? And so anytime you read 
any literature about any of this stuff, you become very familiar with this clab C central line associated bloodstream infection. Is there a new term? Is that an outdated term now? No, that's still the term that I uh, am aware of. That's what we still okay. use in the hospital for sure. Yes, yeah, so you see it everywhere. And the more line, there are more ports that are accessed, you know, the more risk of infection that there is. So sometimes you'll see people with maybe a single line, maybe it's a central, maybe it's an implanted, maybe it's a peripherally inserted. And maybe they have one port, maybe they have multiple. How do you pick one? Does, does having one port only, like let's say somebody was using it for um, TPN or something like that, does that change if you're going to access that you know single line port, if you know that's what it's for? Or if you do have multiple ports, like how, how are you going about picking one of these? Yeah. So the whole like the more ports, more problems is like that's what I always go off. But mm. as a as a line inserter, what the constant battle that I'm running up against is ICU nurses want triple lumens. Patient really doesn't even need a pick line to begin with. And so it's yeah. like, how, how do we <laughs> how do we kind of find this middle ground where, you know, triple lumen is uh, technically four times as much infection risk because you have the central line plus each port um, versus, you know, just doing a single or doing what what the minimally appropriate is for the patient. So. Again, we're not going to make that decision. The line's already in place for all of these. So um, really, if it's it depends on what the indication is. So if you're trying to decide, should I use it or how, which port am I going to use, you're going to want to kind of match the indication to the device that's there. So if they have a pick line, I would say 100%, but I'll, I know I'll get called out if I say that. So 99% of the time, at least now, it's all going to be power injectable. They've really gone away with these non-power injectable ports. Uh, on pick lines and central lines. Power injectable just meaning you can give IV contrast, which is probably the highest pressure uh, fluid that we're going to put through these lines, even more so than um, than like a rapid transfuser in a lot of cases. Don't they so, usually sometimes, maybe it's the standard number on there, so it usually says like five mLs a second or something like that. It has a big five on there. That's exactly. usually the so, standard amount, right? Right. So all of them are going to have some sort of amount on there. Um, and it's usually printed on there or it'll say what gauge device it is. So mm -hmm. as long as it's either says 18 gauge or five mLs a second, uh, it's good. But even still, like if you were to put contrast down one of those lines that uh, that one of those power injectable lines that doesn't say five mLs, because usually at least with with the Bard, which is kind of the most popular, the the red port is your is your port like that's your power injectable contrast five mLs. The other ones I think are down to three. It's usually like a purple and then a gray if it's triple lumen. And in those cases, like if you were to put contrast down, the device still isn't going to fail. They're they're able to withstand those. It's just not recommended. You have a device, you have a, a, a port specifically designed for it. So that's what the manufacturer wants you to use. However, if you put it down the wrong one, you're not going to cause problems. So that's what that whole power injectable thing is, is they're really safe to use, uh, use all the different ports. If you're running into a situation, like you said, where it's a single lumen and they're getting it for TPN, that's where I wouldn't touch it because TPN is usually running 24 hours or 23 with some change, um, bag changeover. Like that's what the, the line's for. Um, those are the people that don't, unless they're like in cardiac arrest, that's kind of our one caveat, I guess, for all these. But don't disconnect their TPN so that you can give them Zofran. Like, just start. Mm -hmm. the <laughs> and don't put anything with the TPN. Just leave it and yeah. accept that that line's not there for your uh, for your vanity. Um, but when it comes to, like, those triple lumens and things like that, <clears throat> yeah, any any uh, any one of them is going to be perfectly fine for what we're going to be given pre-hospitally. Nice. So imagine that, you know, I'm your, your trainee today and we're going out and we we – are going to access one of these lines and I, I grab a syringe and I'm like, here, here we go. You know, we, we have the indications to access this. It doesn't seem to be any obvious issues with it. You look at the site, it doesn't look infected or anything like that. And so you're like, okay, you know, I think we're, we, we might access this thing. How would, how would you walk me through that if we were going to, if I had never touched one of these things before? So the first thing I'd want you to think through is, is this like, We've already talked, it's indicated. So we're going to access it. Is it, um, is the tip in a reasonable location? Like the tip of the catheter, either in the SVC or in some sort of large vein, like the axillary or the innominate vein, is it somewhere reasonable? And I think the best way, uh, based on evidence and experience, is if you can draw back blood and it's very brisk, you're in a good spot. Like it's in a large enough vein that it's not bouncing up against a wall. Uh, your flow rates through that vein of wherever the distal tip is, is high enough. I think you're going to be perfectly safe accessing and using at that point. So 
first thing we're going to swab. So we're going to swab that 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, and that's really something you want to do correctly. I mean, some of them will have those little green caps. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, yeah. those like hub locks. And those are great. Like you really kind of take the position or the need to swab away because they're just bathing in chlorhexidine all the time. Um, so in that case, do you, you don't have still, to So it's just personally, like, even if you take off that cap, do you always, let's, let's say you don't know who put it on or how old it is or anything. Do you always trust those? Like I say, you encountered it in like a nursing home or something like that. Do you always trust those or are you going to also swab with something else? Yeah, I think I do probably to a fault. Um, <laughs> like <laughs> I'd probably still swab for five seconds or so, uh, just out of force of habit. But yeah, I, I would, I would change my practice if I saw those little caps, um, because even if they're not initially used unless they're using the same one for weeks or days at a time um, i find that unlikely um, so give it a good swab you know you want to consider what you're going to be doing but even still our first action is going to be pulling back so if there's any residual bacteria we're going to give that double check of we're going to pull back on the line and then waste that so if we pull back and it's nice and brisk meaning like you give a little bit of negative pressure and you see blood just rush into that the clear part of the lumen i'm going to say that's good like you're in and you're in a big enough vein that you're safe to use. Maybe it's not ideal location, but uh, things are seldom ideal in our environment. So if it's nice and brisk, you're going to waste it. Um, just because you don't know if it's heparinized, uh, it's kind of uncommon to run into the heparinized lines these days. But those concentrations, you don't want to just bolus it in and push it back in. Um, so if it's nice and brisk, throw a flush on, flush it through, make sure it flushes nicely, then give your drugs flush it again. And then as you're just giving that last bit of the flush, just pull that little lock and clamp it. So you have a little uh, positive pressure on there and you're set. You'll be good to go. And it's ready for you uh, the next time you got to use it. So that was kind of my next thing was, um, does it matter if you heparinize them or not? Cause that's what some people will, will, will ask. Okay. You know, I don't know if this hep, this line is heparinized or not, which obviously when you're pulling back, you know, your five mLs of blood, you're pulling, obviously, you know, that, that line is only going to hold an ML or so. So you're obviously pulling, you know, more than what that line holds if you're getting blood all the way from the end. So if there was heparin, you know, you've obviously dis, you know, take that, got the blood in the syringe, you're discarding it. Now you're getting a fresh flush, putting that all the way through. Is there a risk if it was heparinized? Now I'm, now I'm not heparinizing. If, if I do decide to cap it, should I just always run a TKO line just to keep it open to be safe if I'm not going to be constantly giving like an infusion through it? So the, the whole heparinized thing has really fallen out of favor. Uh, and there was a big meta-analysis um, which looked at a whole bunch of different papers and RCTs. I don't remember what year it was, but I think it was like five or so years ago. And it was by Sharma at all. And they looked at, I think they found eight studies, which like enrolled over 3,100 patients. Like it was, it was a pretty fair amount of patients that they looked at. And they just looked at randomized control of saline versus heparin. And they really found no difference. So they were asking like, well, you know, is there, is there a benefit to continue this practice if saline's doing the job? And so they looked at, well, what are the risks? And if you consider the risks of a heparinized solution, I mean, you're usually talking about 10 units of heparin per ml, but it can go as much as like hundred units per ml which per, for perspective, like if you start a heparin drip on somebody with like a PE or an MI, that concentration is 50 units per ml. So we can even be on the higher end of that, uh, that heparin drip concentration just in these little heparinized syringes. Mm -hmm. So the argument for it was always, well, it's not that much heparin. Like it really can't, can't hurt that much. Um, and there must be some benefit to it. So we might as well continue it. But if you have three ports, three lumens <clears throat> um, on a device and you're heparinizing all three of those and then somebody comes and flushes them without pulling back mm -hmm. you can give as much as like a fifth of a bolus dose that you would give for an mi which would be about a thousand units so it's like again it's probably not going to cause serious problems but if that happens multiple times that's like it's just a lot of unnecessary heparin um, for patients that don't really need it and so then you can throw their ptt off and all out of whack and they're clotting and so um, that's why a lot of places have just fallen out of favor. I personally have never even seen or given heparin for a central line. Like I, I don't even see those little, they were little yellow syringes and they were all bright yellow so that you wouldn't accidentally use them. But yeah, I've never even uh, seen one in, in common practice these days. Gotcha. And then you had a, a really important point about if you're going to cap that off, you use a special flushing technique, which is kind of like a stop and go method, but you're saying as you're delivering that last little bit of the flush, it's not your hand that's stopping the flush, right? Like during the flush, you're clamping so that it's the clamp that stops that last 
bolus, not you stopping the the syringe, right? And that's supposed to knock off anything that would be on that catheter. Yeah. So like if you think of our little lure lock tips that are on all of our, our central lines, uh, they work off positive pressure, right? We connect the, it's got a valve system. Once you put the lure lock on there, displaces that little rubber valve. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to just not clamp it and you just um, flush and you say, yeah, I gave it a good, nice flush. And then you go and take that off. What it actually does is it creates just a little bit of negative pressure mm -hmm. and it's going to pull just the tiniest amount of blood up into the distal end of that catheter. And it's going to clot. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second, but if that's your common practice, like you're going to find little clots build on little clots and that line's not going to be good. So we, they came up with this practice of, you know, like you said, you're flushing and then right at that end, you kind of clamp and then add a little more positive pressure, uh, to get rid of that, that negative vacuum effect when you dis disconnect the syringe. And that seems awesome. to have quite a bit of effect for, for the gotcha, process. Cause that little lure locks kind of like a gatekeeper between the end of that line that's in that patient. And so as long as you clamp whatever happens on the lure lock side of things, then when that little plunger comes back, you're saying it won't be able to pull that blood in because that clamp is in the way. And so everything distal to that clamp, as far as the, the device is concerned, is then kind of like positive pressure locked. Exactly. Yep. So you just stop that, that little bit of blood clotting the tip of the line. And you'll see like a lot of lines when they discontinue, like you'll, if they've been in for any period of time, you're going to see this like little trail of RBCs that just start to clot off on the tip. And it's just inevitable, right? It's a foreign device in our bloodstream. Our body's going to try and um, mess with it. So you'll often just see these like little little strings of blood clots. But yeah, by doing that, you assure it's not happening inside the lumen. It's just happening, you know, the natural process on the outside, which doesn't affect the line and the patency of it. So if a service was training people initially, because, you know, I don't know, I don't know how it is. And you guys probably get like way more in, in nursing school because you, you know, deal with this stuff in hospital all the time. But and in regular paramedic school, you know, advanced DMT and stuff, even sometimes in critical care, you don't like really get, unless you did some clinicals and you, you know, an ICU nurse was showing you how to access these things. There's not a ton of, of focus on, and I can't speak to, for all programs, but I, I know I didn't get like anything on pretty much, but if a program was going to enact this and they were trying to reduce harm, they're saying, oh, here's our indications and they go on a good resource and they say, you can access it for X, Y, and Z. Like, what do you think the biggest danger for them would be, whether you're accessing it maybe pre-hospitally or in the emergency department, you have this person, you know, recently trained on it and they're going to go out there and do this for the first time. Like, what would be the big, what would be your biggest uh, fear that they, they make this mistake, uh, you know, during their first time doing this? So I, that's a great question. I ran this kind of idea by a large group of um, central line insertion nurses. Like that's what all they do at hospitals. It's like a Facebook group. Um, and so I asked them, like, what's the one thing you would never want a paramedic doing to your line? And they just, most of them said, don't touch it because they're going to blow it. And so I was like, thinking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, you don't want them to blow the line. And I was like thinking, I'm like, how on earth would you blow the line by using it? And so I went back and I was asking and nobody really had a good reaction to it. It was really like, well, I guess you can't blow it by using it. So you take that harm away of, I'm not going to ruin the line by using it, which is kind of the first step of knowing, okay, it's probably safe to do so if I do so under the right circumstances. And so if you are going to do it, I think the biggest thing to watch out for is just infection, right? You talked a lot about CLABSI uh, and just that, um, why it's so important really is because it comes down to Medicare reimbursements. So if a patient has a central line, they come in and they get an infection to their central line, it just messes with hospital reimbursements, which nobody wants to see happen. Wait, uh, so you're so, telling me that this goes back to money too? Who would have thought, right? Man, it's, it's, it does seems like the answer to every question, but I, I can see how <laughs> maybe they could, they could blow, like if they use too small of a syringe or something like that, like... Uh, I don't yeah, know. That's what the first recommendation first. always is. Is there is there like weight to that? Like they say, never use a syringe that's smaller than a ten cc syringe. Like if you use like a three, like a one or a three or a five, then like that smaller size piston. You know, it's like um, the vacuum. You know, if, you, if you hit somebody like this versus you hit somebody with your knuckle, like the knuckle really hurts because it's like force concentrated. So they say like you know, the real small syringe, you can generate a lot of like pinpoint force and it could like blow the line or something like that. Is that something that's commonly followed in, in the hospital as well? I don't think that's, I think that really came from the days of not having power injectable ports where you really had to be careful of, man, if I put too much pressure on this line, according to manufacturer, it's just going to separate and I'm going to have this, this foreign body that then lodges itself in the PA and causes an embolus. And I, 
I think there's an element of that where it was true, right? It, it happened as they were starting to figure out these devices, but then there's also the manufacturer saying, well, you know, as long as, you know, to protect their own uh, selves in that process. Hmm. But nowadays these lines are so bulletproof. Like you can hook them up to machine pumps or like to these, the CT NGO hmm. um, pumps and they just slam fluids in like much faster than any one ml more pressure than a one ml syringe would generate for sure because contrast has to go in so quickly um, and they do that into ports which are probably the most vulnerable to pressure because it's just like a like a capsule essentially it's, it's like the cap of a bottle and you put too much pressure internally the risk is that it would then separate externally uh, so even in the case of ports, they really stand up really, really well to high pressure. Um, so I, I commonly see 10 ml syringes um, just because of convenience. Mm. It's like enough saline to get through all your ports with one flush. But yeah, I don't, I don't think that that whole practice of you know being really wary and worried about causing focal pressure is is really warranted anymore. Yeah. So if you're just given up, I mean, because sometimes the volume of the medication that you're drawing up is so small. Like a picture you're given like a pain dose of ketamine or something and it ends up being like 0.25 mLs. It's kind of hard to measure in a 10 cc syringe. <laughs> like you yeah, want to sure. something a little bit more exact. Okay. So that's interesting. So um, I guess my, my last part of this it, it probably goes together, which was any, any pro tips that you'd like to pass on to people um, that you've learned from not only working with these lines for, for a long time, but also inserting them. And then is there anything uh, like common mistakes, common pitfalls that you see people make? Uh, so I think the biggest pro tip is, like you said, this is something that's hardly touched on, mm -hmm. uh, especially in paramedic school. I know I, I learned a little bit about it as an EMTB several years ago, but not anything that I remembered. So like ask questions. If you run into patients that have these lines and they're awake, which most of the time they will be, because what I found is the people that present to the ER present um, for issues with these PICC lines, it's rarely that their condition has gotten much worse because this whole at-home antibiotic therapy, at-home chemotherapy, it works really well and it keeps patients from being hospitalized. And that's why it's become such a popular practice. Um, so a lot of the times they're just coming to the ER because their line is not working, it's clotted off, um, and that's what that's their only access is an emergency department. They can't go to their primary doctor and say, hey, can you fix my PICC line? They're just going to send them to the ER. So for those people, like ask them questions, ask, why do you have this line? Or, you know, why did they, do you know why they went with IV antibiotics versus PO? And um, was there anything about, you know, your medical history? And you can just start to ask questions and develop these profiles on what types of people get these lines. And then when you go into that cardiac arrest scenario, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, they got a PICC line. Well, maybe they were battling, you know, sepsis, they were having these infection things or, uh, and they were getting sent home on antibiotics or you just start to get these little pieces of the puzzle, all that comes from just asking questions and building this, um, report. And then also when you get them into the hospital, if you're coming back later and you're like, man, this line just wasn't working. I tried accessing it. That line just was clotted off. Like ask to see the chest X-ray. They're going to get one. It's going to be the first thing they do. And you can take a look at it too and be like, oh yeah, look, that's why it was, it folded back in on itself or it had totally repositioned into the contralateral side and you just start to again build that that uh repertoire of just knowledge about these um about these devices nice i had one more question i forgot to ask you at the outset uh about like red flags with accessing something looking at the actual uh, insertion site whether it's like a dialysis port or an ij or it's in the subclavian or if it's a pick or anything like that looking at the actual site is there anything like if it looks infected do you then not touch it? What if it's just a little bit red? Where Where is the line drawn with that stuff? Or if it's usable, do you just use it? Uh, I, I would probably say if it's usable, just use it. And the reason being is, you know, if they're showing signs of infection, yeah, the line's got to come out. But if you got nothing else, it's direct central venous access. So everything we give is going to get well diluted. It's going to get, um, I don't think it's going to make the patient a lot worse. Now, if it's like, you know, you have a lot of, like purulent drainage coming from it and it looks like the dressing hasn't been changed just yeah i think common sense says don't touch it but if you just see a little bit of redness like they after the insertion alone they they do stay red for a couple of days because mm. you're generally injecting with lidocaine you're cutting in with a scalpel like there's just irritating things about the process um i think what i see the most is just dressings that have gone a little bit too long without getting changed and they they do look 
like not necessarily infected, but they, they look worse for the wear. And you'd probably be inclined to say like, that looks totally, totally wrong. But you know, you take that dressing off and you see, ah, it's not really red. It's not causing him any tenderness. It's probably okay to use. So it's kind of a, I guess it's really a judgment call. There's a hard, it's hard to draw a really hard line in the sand on that one. Um, but if you need the line and you got good access, I think that's, that's your way to go. Awesome. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for answering all my questions about this stuff. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing some of your experience about this. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those topics that is just like, there's a wealth of knowledge and the more we, we build on it, the more comfortable we're going to be with all these devices. Awesome, man. See you next time.